I would like to go ahead and introduce our first uh, uh, speaker at the presentation. Uh, it's going to be about mushrooms. Well, mushrooms, they are the excellent recyclers of the planet, thriving on various substrates. They are the nutritious food supply for us, providing antioxidants, vitamins for us, and promoting nutraceutical compounds. And they can be amazing in Arizona, says our next speaker, our speaker, first speaker, Dr. Barry Pryor, internationally known mycologist and fungal expert. And Barry also estimates that mushrooms are 2.5 billion per year crop in US, and with a potential of farming mushrooms in Arizona, we could cultivate about 10 million industry here in the state of Arizona. So with that, uh, uh, Barry is going to talk about optimizing specialty mushrooms production with special focus on substrate and climate control. Okay, so great. The floor is yours. Oh, I got this. Thank you, Murat. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Can everybody hear me fine in the back? All right, got a thumbs up. Okay, so for today I'm going to be talking about some of our work over the last couple years on um, optimizing mycoculture or mushroom production here at, here at the Controlled Environment Ag Center. Mushroom production is a controlled environment agricultural activity. And the students that have worked in my program have been looking at trying to optimize or increase yields or as, well, as we measure yields in terms of bioefficiency. And, but I'd like to start a little bit about uh, a little bit of my presentation with some of the slides I've shown before um, and, and sort of finish it up as, as well to show, to sort of present the utility of mushroom cultivation. Um, many people are unfamiliar with mushroom cultivation. They might think mushroom cultivation is unusual, maybe even alien. But I hope over the course of this presentation, you'll, you'll appreciate and maybe even be enthusiastic about the opportunities that pre are present themselves when we incorporate mycoculture, mushroom production, into efficient, economic, sustainable, uh, diversified farming systems. So um, first of all, I just have to acknowledge really where this work has been done. And this work is done through a group that we have on campus known as the Mycocats, the Mycocats Recycling with Mushrooms. It was founded or was started in about 2013 with a number of students, in particular these two graduates, whoops, excuse me, these two graduate students, uh, Lauren Jackson and Parker Evans, but over the course of these last few years, there have been 72 Mycocats involved in this program. And together they are moving uh, recycling forward um, on the University of Arizona campus and, are, and have contributed enormously some of the data that I'm going to be showing um, later. We have uh, funding sources from the U of A Green Fund, Arizona Department of Agriculture. We have a number of cooperators here, Tucson Daily Farm, Scorsiac, uh, facilities management, and uh, importantly here, the Arizona Mushroom Growers Association, which is a group of growers, uh, 76 strong right now, or 70, yeah, it's in the 70 strong right now, which has sort of been built up out of this mycoculture program. And the work that we do here at the, at the, at the Controlled Environment Ag Center hopefully is going to directly contribute to increasing the efficiency and perhaps the, the, the prominence of mushroom cultivation here in Arizona and the nation as well. So um, humans are really no uh, strangers to mushrooms and mush, uh, mushroom, cultiva mushroom cultivation or the use of mushrooms in for either nutritional properties, nutraceutical properties, organoleptic flavor properties, and other resources, which we'll talk to you in a minute. In a minute. Some of the first records we have of, of humans utilizing mushrooms come from some cave art in Spain. 7,000 um, uh, 9,000 years ago. Um, and this cave art, as you see, it's, it's associated, here's the mushrooms right here, it's associated with some of these, you know, these prehistoric cattle drawing. And, and it's interesting that these mush, these, this cave art is really, it's been associated with religious experiences or an, a religious slash artistic expression of some of these uh, early, early uh, inhabitants. And some people have suggested that, in fact, those mushrooms that they've drawn there are also associated with probably some of these religious or, or spiritual experiences. And they think they might be the hallucinogenic mushroom, Solospi hispanica, the, the uh, native to Spain these days. So that's interesting that some of our first exposure or our first evidence of mushroom um, utility comes from in this sort of a setting. Now, we all know about Otz the Iceman. 
um, 5,000 years ago. Otzi was found frozen up in the glaciers in Switzerland. And Otzi, we were able to learn a lot about Otzi and, and what they, how he lived. And Otzi was traveling over these glaciers, and he did not carry any food. He did not carry any animal products, plant products. But Otzi did, in his toolkit, and this was his don't leave home without it survival kit, he had two fungi in there. Two fungi in there. One of them was Piptosporus betulina, which is known as one of these medicinal mushrooms. It has antibacterial, antihemanthic properties. Otzi was using these, using it for these purposes. And also Fomis fomitarius, which is a, a, another conch, sort of like uh, Piptosporus. It's used in its very ingenious fire starter kit. So some of these other resources. So it's kind of interesting that some of these first uses of our evidence of, of mushroom use by humans was associated with these nutraceutical properties, these medicinal properties. And really, it's those nutraceutical properties that are kind of driving the rise in mushroom, uh, the, in, the interest in mushrooms today. Um, for example, you know, we can buy these mushroom supplements. You can buy mushroom supplements for, for, for us. We can buy mushroom supplements for our pets. The mushroom supplement, the nutraceutical, mushroom nutraceutical industry is huge these days. And it's really driven by people's understanding of things like conjugated linoleic acids, which are help reduce serum cholesterol level and also are, have these anti-carcinogenic properties. Things like beta glucans these are cell wall constituents of fungi. And they're known also for reducing serum cholesterol um, and, all, and, and as these stimulators of our immune response, both the adaptive and the innate immune responses. Things like ergotheanine, an antioxidant as well. Um, the statins, we all know the statins very well. Powerful uh, anti-cholesterol or uh, uh, um, substances to help reduce our serum cholesterol level, and some of the most widely prescribed pharmaceuticals today. And of course, these other interesting enzyme inhibitors, such as aromatase and 5 alpha reductase inhibitors, that help reduce um, or help modulate biosynthesis of some of these androgens in our bodies, which are very important. As we get older, we need to modify or modulate some of our, 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 um, our hormone levels. Okay? So, um, and, and, and this has really gained prominence worldwide, because even Dr. Wiles, we all know Dr. Wiles, he's the director of the Center for Integrated Medicine here at the University of Arizona, and he's put together this anti-inflammatory food pyramid, because he says that our pro-inflammatory diets, the pro-inflammatory Western diet, is probably one of the most significant contributors to reduced health and reduced longevity. And so here we have this anti-inflammatory food pyramid modeled after the USDA food pyramid, and right smack in the middle, cooked Asian mushrooms, cooked Asian mushrooms. Eat your mushrooms, he's saying. And I want to I want to add to this and say not just Asian mushrooms, all mushrooms, even the the simple button mushroom, the common bush mushroom, is very good to eat. It has many of those properties I just mentioned. So I, I like to say if you want to live to be a hundred, eat your vegetables and eat your mushrooms, right? But I, today I want to talk more about the nutritional properties of mushrooms. The nutritional properties. Now it's a misconception <coughs> that mushrooms are not nutritious. They don't have a lot of calories. So you can't live off them. And I think this has driven that misconception. But overall, mushrooms are hugely nutritious, primarily or principally in their protein con uh, uh, content. Mushrooms are approximately, and across the mushroom uh, groups of mushrooms, about 40% dry weight protein. It's microprotein. It's a top quality protein source. All nine essential amino acids in roughly the same ratio you find in egg. No cholesterol, high in fiber, low in fat, no trans fat a first-class protein source, right? And, you can, and, and the British knew this, right? Because in the 50s and 60s, there was a lot of uh, concern worldwide about um, protein deficiency in developing countries. And the British, of course, had strong interest in, 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 in some of these developing countries and developed this product with a fungus, Fusarium denatatum, where they were actually, it's not, it doesn't even make a mushroom. It's a filamentous fungus, and they grow it in bioreactors. And they make a, a product called well, a micro product, a micro protein product, and it's sold today as this product called corn. And you can buy this at Whole Foods. It's the only place I found it in town. In town, really buy it. It's very, it's an interesting product. Has a nice texture. You know, it's sort of a neutral texture, flavor, kind of like chicken. Um, you can flavor it with all kinds of things. And if you compare this corn to our traditional corn, right, which is less than 10% uh, protein by uh, dry weight protein, deficient in three essential amino acids. Which is the superior protein source? Which is the superior protein source? And of course, there's all these um, 
uh, a number of vitamins and minerals, particularly the B vitamins, particularly the B vitamins. Now, the British were very, the British have a long tradition of trying to advance um, consumption of fungi. And in fact, going back to war, uh, World War I, the trench warfare, there was sufficiently, uh, sufficient malnutrition during this, this period, particularly vitamin B1 deficiency resulting in the, the dietary disease beriberi. And the British came up with an inventive solution to that by creating marmite. Now this is a yeast-based product, also a fungus yeast-based product. Um, and it's a, it's a, 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 it's a spin-off or it's a, it's a product derived from some of the breweries and, the, uh, and what we've, uh, some of the byproducts of brewing industry. And you include in it various vegetables and spice extracts. And you come up with this interesting product called Marmite. And the Australians have another product, or Vegemite, and the Swiss have a similar product. And if you look at some of the nutritional facts about this, you can see how wonderfully nutritious. Look at some of the thiamine, B1, 670% of the recommended daily amounts. Riboflate, B2, 590. B3, 280. B6, uh, 560. Folic acid is B5, B5, um, 180. B12, 400. Hugely nutritious, hugely nutritious. And look at, at look at the protein content. Okay, the nutritional facts. Serving two heaping tablespoons. I don't know if anybody who can eat a heaping tablespoon of Vegemite. It's pretty powerful, pretty powerful. But look, it comes out to 16 grams. How much of it is protein? Nine grams. This is over 50% protein. This is very nutritious. Okay. And it has the slightly salty, bitter, and umami or malty flavor. Now, umami. Umami is one of these new flavor, uh, new taste, um, uh, taste, basic tastes that we can sense. And it used to be we had the four basic, the four basic scents: sweet, salty, bitter, sour. You know, and the and the sweet was, um, you know, to test for sugars. Maybe the salty, of course, we need salt. Bitter to test for different alkaloids. Of, to, to warn us. Um, but over the years, we've known that there was another flavor component in there. It was a savory comp component. And they, they, it's described as having a brothy or a meaty taste, right? And you find it in, in fish and cured meats, mushrooms, tomatoes, um, cabbage, spinach. The principal component of that flavor is glutamic, a glutamic acid. One of the most common non-essential amino acids we find, find in most uh, meat and rich uh, and protein-rich foods. And it was long debated whether umami was actually one of the one of these basic flavors that we can respond to. But in 1985, the term umami or savory was included in those four basic uh, flavor uh, properties, and along with it, uh, um, recognized specific receptors on the tongue which can actually sense glutamates or proteins. So we have receptors on our tongue that drive us to proteins, that drive us to proteins, that drive us to mushrooms as well. OK. But more important than just having protein in there. Now, protein can be described, the qualities of protein can be described in many different ways. And the most widely or the most efficient description of protein or ranking of protein right now is accepted by the US Food and Drug Administration and the National Health Association as the Protein Digestibility Corrected Amino Acid Score, the PDCAAS. And this is a really important score because it's based on both the amino acid requirements of humans and our ability to digest it. So this is really the score we should be looking at. And if we look at some of these uh, different protein sources we have and their PDCAAS score, we can see, of course, cow's milk and egg are number one, right? Because these are things that uh, uh, um, provide nutrients to developing, uh, um, uh, um, to developing organisms. But then we look at soy protein and microprotein. Of course, excellent PDCAS score, excellent digestibility scores. Um, and here we have beef. And here we have, here we have um, uh, Agaricus macrosporus, which in, going, in doing some research on this score, I found that different mushrooms have, in fact, different um, digestibility scores. And I'm going to need to do a little bit more research in there because I found that there was actually quite a bit of variation. So perhaps not all mushrooms are the same in this respect, much like not all legumes are the same and not all vegetables are the same as well. But you can get, you can get a sense of that. So as I said, I wanted to talk about some of the, um, some of the uh, um, sustainability properties of mycoculture. 
and really some of the sustainability properties of, of producing meat. And I, this, I, this was sort of stimulated by a recent National Geographic issue on the carnivore's dilemma. Can we really be, can we really afford to be eating meat the way we have been doing in the past? Can we really, with the, with the globe, the planet seems to be shrinking, populations are growing, arable land is, is reduced, can we keep doing things in terms of our, in terms of developing protein sources like we've been doing before, or do we need to expand? And so what are the impacts of protein production? One of the first um, uh, graphs that they show is the comparison of beef, dairy, pork, eggs on the square footage required to produce a thousand calories. A thousand calories. Now I wanted to change this around. I wanted to turn it into thousand grams of protein. So I took a number of the graphs, a bit of the data that this manuscript, um, this article had, and then I included, I had some of my students include uh, the metrics for mushroom production, for mushroom production. And so we can look at the sustainability of micro protein production using some of the data that was found in, in the references used to generate that National Geographic article. And here's the average square foot required to produce 1,000 grams of protein here, 1,000 grams of protein. Beef, pork, uh, poultry, dairy, mushrooms. Look at how mushrooms rank in there. The average feed, the amount of resources, um, perhaps nitrogen and carbon, required to, in, in calories, in calories required to produce, and this, I'll get back to this a little bit, because this is, relates to bioefficiency, required, required, uh, excuse me, required to produce 1,000 grams of protein. And look how mushrooms rank in there as well. Again, gallons of water to produce 1,000 grams of protein. And most of us think that mushrooms are really a water expensive crop. They're actually not. They're very water efficient, very water efficient. And look, at average gallons of water required to produce 1,000 grams of protein. Almost none for mushrooms. And I actually did a little bit of research on some of the crops. I wanted to look at soybeans. And soybeans ranks right up here to produce 1,000 grams of protein for soybeans, somewhere around 500, 500 gallons of water. Okay, one of the, maybe not the shining star of uh, mushroom sustainability is the, of course, we're interested in CO2 generation, right? The average number of kilograms of CO2 generated to produce 1,000 grams of protein. Look at mushrooms here. Wow, they produce a lot. They're respiring just like us. They're breathing in oxygen. They're breathing out CO2. And they're breathing out CO2 in a big sort of way. And this, part, of this pro, part of this value in here is because mushrooms are growing and we don't eat the whole fungus. We have this, this whole body of mycelium in our mushroom growing chamber that we don't even eat. We only harvest part of it, and the rest of it we recycle, or we do something else with it. But this is not such a bad thing if we think about it inventively, OK? So mushroom cultivation really is a controlled environment activity. All commercial, modern commercial mushroom production is done in controlled environment facilities controlling these three parameters, temperature, humidity, and CO2. And CO2, we're producing a lot of CO2. What other CEA activities do we have that require a lot of CO2? Well, we can link them to our lettuce grow houses or our tomato grow houses. And um, Caitlin Hall, one of Cherry's uh, uh, graduate students, did this really, really innovative study analyzing the sustainability and resource cycling if you co-cultivate mushrooms in one house and, I think in this study, lettuce in another. And again, exchanging air, maybe exchanging water resources. And if you vent from the greenhouse to the mushrooms, you actually can satisfy a lot of the humidity or a lot of the ventilation requirements in this house, as well as providing a lot of humidity as well. And if you bring that CO2 rich air back into these greenhouses, you can um, uh, um, pr uh, provide some of the CO2 requirements for enhanced plant production as well. And so uh, Caitlin did some really nice uh, um, analysis here. And if you can, you can look over here and you can see in most cases, except during except energy use during the monsoon season, both at night and, and, and uh, during the day, most of our energy use and our water use comes down when we collect these two um, controlled environment activities. Okay? So we can, the CO2 expensive mycoculture mushroom production is not really a, a liability. It could be considered an asset if we link it properly. Okay. So now I want to talk one more thing about bioefficiency, because this is what my talk is really going to be focused on, is bioefficiency. How efficient are mushrooms in terms of producing um, proteins? And one of the big metrics we have is this term called biological efficiency. And we, this efficiency is our fresh weight of the mushrooms we receive, we produce, 
from uh, over the dry weight of the substrates, the compounds we use to produce those mushrooms. And this really is an evaluation of yield for the quality of mushrooms. And this is used a lot. It's used very frequently when we're talking about uh, the conversion of carbon to other sort of sources. For example, when we're talking about how efficient our, our other protein sources are in their conversion. So a comparison of bioefficiencies from these other protein sources. And so what I want you to think about is this, this is alfalfa pellets. If I had 100 grams, of, 100 grams of dry alfalfa pellets and I fed them to beef, I might get about 5 to 15 pounds of beef. If I fed that to chicken, 30 to 50 pounds of chicken. If I fed it to crickets, right, I could get maybe 70 to 90 pounds of crickets. Pretty efficient. But if I fed them to mushrooms, 80 to 150 pounds of mushrooms. Of course, a lot of that is water still. But that's how bioefficiency is, is measured. And remember, it's about 40% protein here. This is about, meat is about 20% protein, OK? Um, crickets, I'm not quite sure what the percentage is there. And the interesting, the water, uh, water usage is lower, and they have a lower uh, uh, land footprint as well. And you can feed the mushrooms things, even the chickens and the crickets won't eat. That's the amazing thing. And then at the end of it all, you can take all that spent substrate and feed it back to the chickens and crickets. So again, closing energy loops, closing resource loops. Okay, the champion of the mushroom industry right now is Agaricus spiceforus. And really, here's an example of the white button mushrooms, the carminis, and the portobellos. They're really all one species, just different varieties of those species, different selections of that one species. But really, what I want to talk to you about today is what we grow here and what a lot of the small growers across Arizona are growing, what are known as the specialty mushrooms. These are the oyster mushrooms, the shiitakes, the piapinos, the lion's manes, the maitakes. These are the high value mushrooms that are driving the market today. These are the nutraceutical mushrooms. These are the mushrooms people are interested in. Um, and the, pr the production process is, is, is a, a, a sort of multiple step. You start with preparing your cultures. You start with preparing your spawn. These are sort of microbiologically uh, sensitive activities. You do this in the lab. But then we we're going to make our substrate. We're going to make spawn. Spawn is sort of like the seeds of the mushroom industry, sort of like a tomato seed. I'm going to plant that in the ground. Uh, the spawn are the seeds that I'm going to inoculate my substrate with. We're going to have a production flush. We're going to harvest. It's a multi-step process, but really it's not so complicated because there's really four principles in mushroom production. You create a nutrient source, the substrate, which you're going to grow your mushrooms. You're going to inoculate the substrate with your fungus spawn, so it's going to dominate. You're going to manage the environment to favor initial growth, nutrient utilization. That's the spawn run, the colonization of your substrate. And then you're going to manage the environment, again, to favor the periodic flush of your mushrooms managing these three uh, parameters right here most specifically. And so what impacts mushrooms, mushroom bioefficiency? Well, of course, the growth material, the spawn, carbon sources, nitrogen sources of your substrate, and then the temperature, the environment, the temperature, relative humidity, and CO2, and in fact, lighting. So a lot of these things can, in fact, uh, impact bioefficiency. The project started, doing these studies started with Lauren Jackson, one of those graduate students I mentioned before. And he wanted to see. Uh, he did a sort of a three-component um, uh, uh, a three-component um, analysis of the impact of both the carbon, the nitrogen, and this amendment here, wood chips, using mesquite as sort of the base, mesquite for the production. And he did this interesting analysis here. Uh, and he, in this experiment, he combined these three things at different ratios, like 16 different kinds of combinations. And then he did some interesting ANOVAs. Uh, to separate out the contribution of wheat straw to bioefficiency, the legumes to bioefficiency, and the mesquite wood to bioefficiency. Separated them out. And what he found out that the wheat straw really didn't contribute much to bioefficiency, no matter whether it was, zero, whether it was 10% or 60%. The, the mesquite pods, however, did contribute substantially to bioefficiency, as you can see here, a significant contribution. And interestingly, when we think about uh, mushroom production, Wood is often used in some of these specialty mushroom uh, uh, production operations, but mesquite wood does not seem to be a very suitable source. We're not quite sure the reasons for that, but the more mesquite wood we added to these mixtures, the less bioefficient, uh, the less bioefficiency we achieve. Okay, and then we wanted to look, and then Lauren, of course, wanted to take this down to the nutritional or the or the um, the properties of the mushrooms that were produced. And we want to see if we add more mesquite pods, because there is some suggestion that when you add more legume to your mushroom substrate, your protein content goes up. 
And he found, actually, it didn't really. We had some, some increase, some significance in, in when you went from 0% pods to 80% pods. Yes, you did get an increase in protein production. But really, when you went from 40% to 60% to 80% pods, you did not get a significant increase in protein in those mushrooms. 40% protein. That's about what it was. And again, ash composition, lipid composition, we didn't see any significant contribution between um, increasing mesquite pods and the resulting mushroom. So we continued this ex exploration of the impact of, of substrate in bioefficiencies. And we really wanted to look at it, the impact of these combinations of straw and mesquite, whether it was 90% straw, 10% mesquite, or 50-50. And really, what was the ideal combination ratio if we were looking at production of these four mushrooms, which you're going to see again and again in this presentation, uh, Pleurotus ostratus, which is the standard pearl mushroom, uh, col uh, Columbinus, uh, Eringii, and Citropolidius. Um, and this is the, the, the pearl oyster, blue oyster, king oyster, and golden oyster. And if we look at this, we can see that they all sort of responded um, kind of similarly. And in fact, this 70% straw mesquite uh, mixture seemed to work well with most of them. And so we've been using this as sort of our regular uh, mainstay mush uh, mushroom substrate combination. And I'm sorry, I don't have the error bars on here. The students who put this together for me, they just they said, oh, we didn't get the error. And I said, it's OK. We'll do it next time. Um, and then we wanted to look at the, we wanted to start changing around some of these um, some of these components, whether it was going to be straw or the mesquite pods, and, and mixing up different carbon sources. Here we were looking at straw versus corn stalks versus sorghum versus buffalo grass, right? And we wanted to see their impact on bioefficiency here for blue, pearl, king, and golden oysters. And again, we were, here we were using cottonseed as our, 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 um, as our nitrogen source. And we can see here that, in fact, using these different types of carbon, we didn't really impact bioefficiency too much. It didn't matter. There seemed to be a little bump with sorghum. But it didn't seem to matter if we were using straw or buffalo grass. We kind of got the same sort of bioefficiency. It was quite different, though, when we were looking at our nitrogen sources and these other additives. In fact, and here we're looking at cotton, mesquite pods, alfalfa pellets, and here we had alder shavings. And here we did get a significant difference in the bioefficiency. I mean, cotton clearly was the champion here in all species we looked at. Well, excuse me, in these three main species here. Cotton gave us higher bioefficiency. And this was a significant, you don't see the error bars, but it was significant. And interesting, we got this uh, golden, <laughs> golden, we got this bump with uh, alder shavings for the golden mushroom. That one we found interesting. But for most of these, cottonseed. This is the fuzzy cottonseed. It's not cotton meal. It's whole cottonseed that's been delinted. All right. Um, impact of substrate on spawn production. So here we wanted to look at this. Now we're looking at spawn. We're looking at spawn. And we're trying to see, you know, the spawn is sort of the seeds we're using to inoculate. And we wanted to see, did we grow spawn on cracked corn? Are we going to grow it on barley? Are we going to grow it on rye berries or on rye grass? And you can see here that, again, there was, um, hmm, let's see, blue. Uh, and here we have the, the oyster shirts, but here we have days of colonization. Days of colonization. So with spawn production, we want this substrate, we want the spawn to be colonized very quickly. When we inoculate it, we want it to be colonized very quickly because if it stumbles, if you get any delay in colonization, you have the opportunity for other microbes to take over. Remember our basic premises or basic principles. You want your, you want your substrate and your spawn to be colonized rapidly. And here you can see that cracked corn clearly was the champion. Colonization in 12 days with cracked corn. Versus, and here it's, uh, and some of these mushrooms perform differently. They grow slower. Versus 20 days, almost two, almost um, a week later, using rye grass. Now that week, a lot can happen in that week. So that's just, in fact, it's non-productive time. You want your spawn to be colonized rapidly. Okay. And then so temperature also has an effect here. So this is our spawn. Here's our cracked corn. Here's midway colonized. Here's fully colonized right here. And the effect of temperature on colonization of spawn. Now, the blue and the white oyster, there really wasn't a big effect of temperature. They all colonized within about 10 to, 10 to 13, 14 days. But these other, the king oyster and the golden oysters, those slower growers, when we had colder temperatures, it took them over four weeks to colonize that bag of spawn. That's not good. 
that's not, we have problems then, we stumble, we sometimes get secondary contaminants and we have to throw away the bags. We want them to colonize quickly so that we can use them, so that we have less contamination and we can use them quickly. Okay, we have the same effect of temperature on the spawn run. Here's, the, here's our substrate, our bag of substrate here, and here's partially colonized or not colonized, partially colonized, fully colonized. And again, we want this to happen very quickly, so we're measuring the days until colonization at the different temperatures. And using cotton or using mesquite pods, we seem to, seem to give a similar response. We colonize the blue oyster and the pearl oyster very quickly, uh, about two weeks, a little more than two weeks, and about three weeks for these other two. So we didn't get a big difference in there. But what we did get, and this is the impact of temperature on spawn run, but what we did get is the impact of temp or the impact of temperature um, on on the spawn run <coughs> in regards of bioefficiency of the final product. So here, when we had temperatures of our spawn run from 18 to 30 degrees, and then we used the spawn to colonize our substrate, we got these bioefficiencies. And even the golden oyster, which we don't never get high bioefficiencies, even this range of temperature of our spawn run, the colonization, not even the fruiting step, the colonization step didn't really make a difference. But when we raise the temperature of the spawn run, that colonization step, with our king oysters, we kill bioefficiency. In other words, if the king oyster was colonizing that bag at a hot temperature and then you moved it in production, it didn't budge. It didn't budge. What we would have to do is take that fully colonized bag, put it in a cooler for two weeks, chill it all down, sort of reset the, the biology of the fungus. So these are some interesting things we're using. And, and these kinds of, uh, these kinds of uh, um, these, these data, um, the mushroom growers of Arizona, these small growers of Arizona can use. Okay, and then the impact of fruiting temperature on bioefficiency. And this is really perhaps the most important thing here because when we're actually putting our mushrooms out into, and we're like, when we're growing the mushrooms and we put them out into our grow houses, um, you have to keep the temperature right. Now, some of them will produce over a range of temperatures. For example, a oyster from 18 to 30 degrees, pretty good. Look at the blue oyster and the, and the, and the, and the pearl oyster. 21 degrees, anything below about, uh, above 70 degrees Fahrenheit, production drops. And this is um, at, at 24 degrees or at 30 degrees, we get nothing. And at 27 degrees, we're dropping very rapidly. Well, this is the blue oyster here, 24 degrees, we almost get nothing. So temperature during production is critical for bioefficiencies. Okay, other environmental effects on production. Um, water, pearl oysters, um, you, grow, you grow them when the water content is 95, 100%, 100%, they get soggy. The other mu uh, mushrooms don't seem to impa get impacted so much with that high humidity. But pearl oysters will get soggy. Um, everything's fine between about 80, 85%, and then if you drop below 65 for any length of time, your clusters start to abort. CO2, everything's fine if you keep it near ambient. As soon as you start raising your t CO2, things start to look weird. Your mushrooms become deformed, and pretty soon you stop production over 1,200 parts per million. And this is what you're looking like at about 1,000 parts per million. They're very deformed. These mushrooms are not happy. They don't want to be fruiting anymore. And then lighting. Lighting is something we learned fairly recently that under dim light, you get, um, you get poor color production, which is fine for a pearl, but not fine for a blue. And under bright light, you get good color production, which is not good for a pearl, but fine for a blue. But also, we get increased pinning when we get certain levels of light. And we haven't even explored this sufficiently. We haven't even explored the, the full impacts of lighting on bioefficiencies. OK, I'm running late here, so I'm just going to fast. Mushrooms are the great decomposers. So we have all kinds of other spin-offs of incorporating mushrooms into our uh, a diversified farm, farming systems for being able to utilize all these agro-industrial wastes, the straws, the tomato pumice, coffee crumbs, and we can utilize those and recycle those rather than dump them off into other sort of, other sort of uh, um, waste uh, streams. And then finally, the substrate can be repurposed. Once we grow the mushrooms and we finally utilize the substrate, we then can just um, start recycling that as compost. And of course, there's these other benefits, these other uses these other resources for microcultivation that we can incorporate and link to our microculture programs such as microremediation, microengineering, the pharmaceuticals, and all of this uh, then adds to the utility and the efficiency and the sustainability of mushroom production as, as an industry. And so finally, in summary, you know, microculture or microproduction is um, diverse, it's sustainable, 
It's a profitable industry um, and can be incorporated in many different ways. Many additional resources can be derived from microculture, not just the mushrooms. And so my question is always, we've got to be visionary here. We've got to say, where are we going to be growing mushrooms in the future? Are we going to be growing them off the continental shelf? Are we going to be growing them at the lunar greenhouses? And of course, my favorite, mushrooms to Mars, right? OK, thank you. A whole other area came to my mind in regard to the toxicology associated with mushrooms. And we have things in the area of mining where tailings have been contaminated with arsenicals. We have the 50 years after Chernobyl to look at. We have a forest fire going on right now. And even though mushrooms can grow on virtually anything, we have to pay attention to the entire ecocycle and the aspect of would the mushrooms be healthy for humans or for other animals who then eat them and they become part of our food cycle. Okay, so regarding use of... So. Okay, uh, regarding micro-remediation, that's a very good question that you posed. Um, one of the reasons mushrooms or fungi um, perform the role of recyclers and decomposers in the planet is because they produce a whole arsenal of extracellularly secreted enzymes that break down things externally to them. Um, and notable among these enzymes are lacases and peroxidases, and there's whole families of those that they produce. And these are really powerful enzymes, and some of the most uh, uh, powerful degradative enzymes there are. For example, uh, fungi can degrade lignin, which is probably the most recalcitrant molecule, ma macromolecule on Earth to, to break down. And certain fungi do it quite well through their lacases and peroxidases. Moreover, they can break down most any industrial contaminant as well, whether it's petroleum products, uh, pharmaceuticals. And in the case of my lab, I had a student who was looking at the ability of mushrooms to break down aflatoxin because we were working with mesquite pods and that was a very concern. We wondered, gosh, if you're growing mushrooms on mesquite pods, will they be contaminated? Well, what, we, what Warren Jackson did is he artificially contaminated corn to, um, I think it was 10,000 parts per billion aflatoxin, which is really contaminated, and then he grew mushrooms on that corn. What he found is that the mushrooms that were produced were absolutely aflatoxin free. And the corn that he grew them on was the aflatoxin level was reduced from 10,000 parts per billion aflatoxin to less than 100 parts per billion aflatoxin. Now, at that level, it's still too contaminated for human consumption, but it is suitable for animal feed. So you can take some absolutely toxic aflatoxin contaminated product and actually render it suitable for livestock feed. Now, and, and fungi can do this with most compounds. They can break down, like I was telling, so they can break down our tennis shoes, basically, and they can break down anything we throw at them. They'll break them down, and they won't be. And as far as we know, as far as what's been looked at, they won't become contaminated. The one challenge with mycoculture, the one challenge is they bioaccumulate heavy metals, and this is a problem with with mushrooms, is uh, whether you're growing them in in culture or if you're collecting them out in the wild. So if you're out mushroom hunting in soils that are heavily contaminated with arsenic, for example or some other types of heavy, heavy metals, those mushrooms might be have uh, excessive levels of those contaminants as well. So that would be the one concern with aflatoxin. We grow, we grow mushrooms on pizza boxes. So what we make sure is that yes, we shred them up and we grow them. But we make sure that the pizza boxes use soy-based based ink as opposed to other types of ink, which might result in Yeah, this uh, question is for Dr. Pryor. There are many uh, poisonous uh, mushroom species in the wilderness, and uh, many people die from eating those uh, types of mushroom. I wonder, just by looking, if they could be, you know, get an idea whether they are could be poisonous or not poisonous. Is there any way you can tell just by looking? Well, well, first of all, not many people die from mushroom poisoning. Not many. It's not. I mean, it's. It might be perceived as common, but it's really very uncommon. And I like to bring up the point that there are far, far, far more poisonous plants than there are poisonous mushrooms. Far more. 
And if you think of the ecology of a plant versus the ecology of a mushroom, you might understand why a plant basically is sitting there um, day in and day out, year after year, and has to protect itself from herbivory. Mushrooms are very ephemeral. They pop up, and in a week they might be gone. Not really need for them to develop these defense mechanisms to protect themselves from herbivory. So although I think at our, our SEAC uh, uh, leadership dinner I talked about the uh, 5 million species of mushrooms, and, or 5 million species of fungi, and the uh, 20,000 species of mushrooms, and the 500 that are edible, uh, you know, of those mushrooms, there's probably only 50 to 60 that are considered poisonous. And of those 50 to 60, only a handful are deadly poisonous. And of that handful, it's just two mushrooms worldwide that account for 90% of the fatal mushroom poisonings, and that's uh, Amanita phylloides and Amanita varosa. And they are very deadly, <laughs> no doubt about it, very deadly. But mushroom poisoning is not a common thing, not at all. But it does get headlines, and so it's probably disproportionately uh, elevated in our minds as something to be aware, uh, something to be concerned about. And it, of course, it leads to uh, mycophobia, fungophobia as well. So um, there are some rules, there are some care, uh, uh, things to follow in terms of foraging for mushrooms. There's things to look out for and things not to. But really, you have to be aware of the of the dead of the poisonous ones and, and and be careful of those. And of course, don't eat anything you don't know of. Absolutely, you would never go up to Mount Lemon and wander through the woods, picking and chewing bits of vegetation here and there, and eating it and swallowing it because you probably would not come out of the mountains alive. So you wouldn't do this with mushrooms either. 